Platformers are my favorite genre of video games. The simple act of jumping from platform to platform, bopping enemies, and dodging hazards is a simple concept to understand, and has traditionally translated well into video games. When a game gets it right, the experience is often excellent. When a game gets it wrong, something feels off. It can be difficult to put into words. One might call the controls twitchy, unresponsive, heavy, loose, or just surmise they are bad. When playing the 8-bit version of Sonic the Hedgehog, I can't can't help but feel like something is off with the jumping. There is a preciseness missing. Landing on small platforms doesn't feel correct. Sonic's momentum in midair is twitchy, and players might find Sonic doesn't have the agility one might be expecting. I think the problem is the acceleration while in the air. When jumping, Sonic can quickly gain a ton of speed. The acceleration is quite brisk. Unfortunately, this brisk acceleration does not allow for precision. This makes landing on some platforms an awkward experience as players try to correct for this quirk. This is most visible in the very first stage. There is a ramp which launches Sonic into the air, and Sonic keeps accelerating far beyond the speed of the camera. In fact, the acceleration in the air far exceeds that of Sonic rolling down a hill, which I find curious. That isn't to say the controls are bad. After a while, I found myself adjusting to the unique physics, delicately stopping Sonic mid-air and using the quick jumping acceleration to get through the stages faster. However, the controls lack the preciseness of some other 8-bit platformers, like the Donkey Kong Land games, for example. Sonic the Hedgehog has other physics oddities as well. Sonic reacts strangely on certain angles or slopes. This makes the second boss encounter with Eggman extremely easy. Sonic's momentum will allow him to rock back and forth, easily inflicting multiple hits to Eggman without fear of Sonic stopping, returning to a standing position, and taking damage himself. It feels somewhat thoughtless, like playtesters should have noticed something was amiss and the programmer should have tweaked some values to prevent such abuse. But alas, this was not the case. In fact, all of the bosses in the game are easy. The first boss can be hit eight times and be defeated before Eggman ever launches an offensive attack. A skilled player can also get in eight hits on the third Eggman encounter while only dodging a single attack. The damage exchange is most definitely in the player's favor here. This odd damage exchange continues with the fourth boss. A player will only need to dodge two attacks while dishing out eight of their own, although one could argue at least the difficulty is progressing. The final encounter at least offers up a semblance of challenge. Unfortunately, the projectile from the ceiling can be cheesed by staying on a safe point on the left side of the screen. The second attack is challenging because the hit detection is poor. Sonic can take damage while being a considerable distance from the flame attack. Still, with some practice, and positional awareness, this final boss does not test the player's skill or dexterity. It is just a slow plotting fight, waiting for the right moments to strike. Speaking of slow and plotting, the most infamous stage found in the 8-bit version of Sonic the Hedgehog is definitely Labyrinth Zone. Not only does Sonic move slowly underwater, but the game is almost in a perpetual state of slowdown, reducing the game speed even farther. Never in my life has a 5-second countdown moved at such a glacial pace. You know what else is weird? When nearing the conclusion of most stages, Sonic changes colors. The game briefly freezes, a new color palette is loaded, and Sonic's blue shade is lightened. It is incredibly odd, and I can't say I have ever experienced this in a video game, ever. Needless to say, it would be difficult for me to conclude Sonic the Hedgehog on the Game Gear is a great game. The controls are strange, the physics need work, there are odd graphical issues, and the boss design is mostly poor. However, Sonic the Hedgehog is a beloved title, and many even prefer the game over the 16-bit title of the same name. Despite the lack of technical polish, I too found myself enjoying this iteration of Sonic the Hedgehog. What kept me coming back for multiple playthroughs was the variety of the stages. Despite the the occasional high-speed antics, 8-bit Sonic's design philosophy is far more traditional. Each of the game's six worlds offer new stage designs, new hazards to contend with, and an ever-increasing difficulty curve as the game nears its conclusion. The first zone, Green Hill, has two relatively easy acts. There are few pits to fall into, enemies are passive, and there are few technical jumps to be found. Bridge Zone ups the ante with bottomless pits, collapsing bridges, more aggressive enemies, and new stage gimmicks like this teeter-totter. The second stage is even an auto-scroller, forcing the player along and limiting the player's time to react to what is ahead. 
Like I said, the design philosophy here mirrors traditional platformers from the time with less focus on mastering a deep physics engine to find secrets and shortcuts. Some might find this less than desirable in a quote unquote Sonic game. However, I'm not sure judging a game's quality based on my own arbitrary rule set is fair. Moving along is Jungle Zone. Being the third world, the difficulty continues to progress. There are more bottomless pits to contend with, more spiked hazards to navigate through, and more moving platforms to jump on. The one-off gimmicks continue as well with this little log Sonic can roll on. The second act offers something new, a completely vertical stage. Sonic starts at the bottom and has to work his way up. Again, this does not align with Sonic's stereotypical fast gameplay, but the stage is well designed. There are a number of different platform sizes, some with spikes, some platforms move, others collapse, and there are a number of enemies to deal with. Missing a platform can be deadly as well, thanks to the enemies and spiked platforms. Now is probably a good time to talk about some Game Gear specifics. It is my understanding the screen does not scroll down in the Master System version, making Bridge Zone Act 2 particularly brutal as Sonic will perish rather than the screen scrolling downwards. However, as I do not own that version of Sonic the Hedgehog, I can only speculate on how the differences impact the game design. There are other differences as well, such as changes to level layouts, graphical effects like these moving flowers in Green Hill, or the fences in Bridge Zone. Other changes are major, like completely redone level layouts and nerfed bosses. Without playing both versions though, I cannot determine which game is superior, so I won't. Another thing to note is the reduced screen resolution. The Game Gear's resolution is less than half that of the Sega Master System. As best as I can tell, the Master System version is the source version and the target platform. Therefore, the Game Gear version could be suspect to the dreaded screen crunch. In fact, if one is more familiar with the Master System version, the footage here probably looks downright claustrophobic. Thankfully, there were few moments where I felt the level design was made for higher specs. There is a leap of faith jump in Bridge Zone Act 1 where the player isn't able to see the platform ahead. Prior to this jump, the game generally had little level markers alerting the player to wait for the platform to appear, but it is missing for some reason. Bridge Zone Act 2 offers another tight area where the player needs to navigate upwards while the screen scrolls. A first time player will probably not have enough time to navigate upwards before the platforms pass, as it isn't immediately obvious where the level path lies. Again, an arrow pointing upwards would offer players a clue with the reduced resolution. Level hazards can occasionally surprise the player as well. In Labyrinth Zone, it can be difficult to anticipate the appearance of the rotating spikes for example, since most of their rotation occurs off screen. Scrap Brain Act 2 also features projectiles fired from off screen, and the player often doesn't have enough time to react. And that is about it. While playing through Sonic the Hedgehog, I rarely felt like I was playing a game made for a home console rather than a handheld system. The level design and enemy patterns mostly work on the small screen, and the camera generally panned up and down, left and right, always keeping the relevant information in view. Anyway, back to the level variety. Labyrinth Zone is of course the underwater zone with different platforming physics along with the bubble element. Sonic needs to move quickly from water bubble to water bubble to avoid drowning. While the molasses pace is less than satisfying, the idea is sound. The player cannot afford to lollygag and needs to make it to the next air source before the timer kicks down. The concept is logical, adding a sense of urgency and increasing the challenge. But the execution here is lousy. Scrap Brain Zone is next. While the first act is a linear romp, the second act changes things up dramatically. There are now branching paths, doorways leading to new areas, and even warp points. Players need to hit a switch to open up the pathway forward, then backtrack to reach the other side. This actually confused me at first, and I didn't like the fact I was forced to explore and memorize a map under a time limit. While I don't think I ever actually ran out of time here, it seems like this could have been omitted. And it was in Act 3. Rather than a boss battle, Scrap Brain Act 3 is actually a third stage, following a similar non-linear maze-like structure complete with switches. And yeah, the time limit was eliminated, similar to the true boss fights. Finally, there is Sky Base Zone. The first act has an electricity gimmick where certain portions of the screen are electrified, preventing progress. The timing can be tough and sometimes misleading, but as the game nears the final stretch, the difficulty is progressing nicely. The final act 
is a bit strange. There are two ways through the stage, and shown here is the alternate route through the act on the way to a Chaos Emerald. Screen crunch can also be a problem here, as players cannot see the position of the rotating gun turrets. This path is optional, however, so it is hard to complain too much. Still, despite my complaints about the jumping controls, physics, and bosses, I do like the level design. The game starts off easy, and the difficulty slowly increases with each passing stage. Bottomless pits become more plentiful, there are more moving platforms, and stage hazards become more aggressive. The skill needed from the player is always increasing, helping keep players engaged. I also really dig the one-off stages, the auto-scrolling of bridge zone, the vertical climb in jungle, the branching paths of scrap brain, or the electricity in sky base. I feel as though Sonic the Hedgehog does an admirable job of keeping the stage design fresh through new mechanics. While the physics-based elements of the 16-bit original are missing, the stage design is still solid. However, I can't help but feel like the game is a little too easy, and even this is a puzzling revelation. First, when Sonic takes damage, he loses rings and has zero opportunity to regain them. This is a fantastic alteration to the formula, as it actually creates a punishment for sloppy play. There are now moments where the player has to play extra cautious, as the cushion of an infinite ring loop has vanished. Boss encounters are the same. There are no rings here. The player has to battle Eggman without taking damage, which is occasionally tricky when initially learning the patterns. To balance this, each boss area does hide an extra life monitor, though they won't reappear after death. However, despite these restrictions, Sonic the Hedgehog is not a difficult game. For one, farming extra lives is easy. There are plenty more extra lives lurking in the levels, and often right out in the open. Second, if one has at least 50 rings when they pass the end post, they'll be whisked away to a special stage. Here, rings are plentiful, allowing one to nab 100 of them, earning an extra life. There are also continues within, and more extra life monitors. Reaching the end post with 50 rings is usually easy as well, as enemy placement is sparse at best. There just aren't many opportunities for Sonic to lose rings in many of the stages, making reaching the bonus areas almost trivial. In fact, due to the relatively short length of the game, less than 45 minutes, and the abundance of extra lives and earned continues, it would be difficult for me to complain complain about the lack of infinite continues, as the omission does not conflict with the game design. The lack of enemies may be a concession to the game engine, though. Sonic the Hedgehog has some serious slowdown issues. Whenever there are more than just a couple of sprites on the screen, the gameplay chugs along. I've reviewed a number of Master System games over the years, and none of them feature such an inconsistent frame rate. Not only does it look bad, but it affects the controls, as Sonic's momentum and inertia while jumping frequently cuts in half. I certainly cannot comment on the programming, as I have not viewed the source code, and wouldn't be able to determine how efficient it is anyway, but Sonic the Hedgehog does not feel like a polished product. Slowed on aside, the sprite and tile work looks nice. Sonic is detailed and well animated and looks great for an 8-bit sprite. Enemies mostly follow suit, although a few are laughably small compared to the rest of the game. Even Eggman looks stunning with his major features captured perfectly on the small screen. Backgrounds are generally detailed and rarely does the player find themselves staring at solid patches of color with little detail. Color swapping techniques are used to create flashing lights and scrap brain, lighting effects in sky base, and cascading waterfalls and jungle zone. The art style is terrific. Areas represent real-world locales like rolling hills and flying bases, while still being abstract and imaginative. While no one would mistake this for a Genesis game, the art direction is still distinct and appealing. Even better, the soundtrack is amazing. The composer listed in the credits is Yuzo Koshiro, who composed the music in Streets of Rage. As one would expect from such a name, the compositions in Sonic the Hedgehog are rich, with a depth to the melody not often present on the platform. Bridge Zone is definitely the standout, with a ridiculously catchy hook that should sound very familiar to fans of pop music. Jungle is very unique, with the square waves and noise channels producing some very unique instrument sounds I have never heard from the platform. The melody is incredibly upbeat, with a whimsical country twang that never grew tiring with each passing loop.
Labyrinth flips the switch from upbeat to mysterious. I can't help but get gumshoe vibes as I listen, imagining a crime sleuth following the clues to catch the criminal. The blues vibes linger throughout, and again I am pleasantly surprised at what the composer was able to achieve on the primitive hardware. Skybase is also fantastic, exploding with energy. Seriously, the music could easily pass as something from Streets of Rage, or dare I say it, Mega Man. Yeah, I'm not exaggerating here. The complex melody, speeding up, slowing down, layering rock notes over a bed of synth sounds absolutely incredible, and the soundtrack alone is probably worth the price of entry. So, as we near the finish line, I need to reach some sort of conclusion. While I'm aware this is quite the rush of nostalgia for many, with some claiming the game is superior to its 16-bit counterpart, and many more having fond memories blasting through the game on family vacations or the school bus, this isn't that kind of video. The 8-bit version of Sonic the Hedgehog is not great. Donkey Kong Land 2 is great, with tight controls, more developed level design, more engaging bosses, and a much more challenging completion run. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I forgot about the Chaos Emeralds. Each zone contains a Chaos Emerald to find. Sometimes these are obvious and hard to miss. Others require a bit of exploring. And the one in Skybase requires a leap of faith onto a floating platform to reach. It is a neat completion bonus, I suppose, but really functions as an ancillary collectible for those who like that sort of thing. More to the point, while Sonic the Hedgehog is mostly inoffensive, other titles with similar hardware restrictions are superior. While I play 8-bit Sonic the Hedgehog, I can't help but be reminded of a certain other Sonic game, Sonic Lost World. This bemoaned title features a fantastic presentation, a mouth-watering soundtrack, but strays pretty far from the Sonic formula with its own controlled quirks, but I find the experience rather palatable. For all the less than stellar elements featured here like the controls, inconsistent frame rate, labyrinth zone, and breezy bosses, the game lacks anything frustrating and nothing here is annoying, cheap, or padded. The difficulty progression is thoughtful, though little here requires much skill or dexterity from the player, reducing the reward for playing in the first place. However, while the controls could be tweaked and the level design be more mature, the presentation is pleasing enough and the soundtrack is stellar. One might argue the soundtrack is is the tangible reward for progressing deeper into the adventure. Combined with the minimal screen crunch and generous life system, I found Sonic the Hedgehog enjoyable, and it held my attention during multiple playthroughs. Just not because of the game design. Instead, for more subjective things, like the novelty of playing Sonic on limited hardware. In short, Sonic the Hedgehog is a mediocre game, and sometimes for me, that is good enough.